Welcome to our program on semiconductors in the US-China tech dispute. This is the fourth of five programs in our Seeking Truth Through Facts US-China program series. We have a terrific lineup today. 380 people have signed up with us. Our three chairs, Ken Wilcox, our honorary chair, Jack Wadsworth, and our chair emeritus, Chung Moon Lee. We have about 16 board members with us as well and colleagues joining us from Hong Kong and Southern California. I'm Margaret Conley, the executive director of the Northern California Center. Our format for today, I will introduce Dan Wong who joins us from Beijing and he will give a keynote presentation. After that, he'll introduce four guest speakers. They'll have a moderated discussion and then we're gonna open it up to audience Q&A. If you have a question, type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can begin doing that right now. Dan is gonna be monitoring those throughout the program. All speaker bios are on our website and they can also be found in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. This program is on the record. We are recording and this event will go until 6.30 p.m. Pacific. Now, a few words about our keynote presenter, Dan Wong. Dan is a technology analyst at Gavcal Dragonomics, an independent provider of investment research. He writes on China's technology and the impact of U.S. sanctions and regulations. He tracks China's semiconductor capabilities, U.S. measures on CFIUS and export controls, Huawei, and broader Chinese industrial policy. Before Gavcal, Dan worked right here in Silicon Valley, and fun fact, he studied philosophy. Dan, welcome back. Thank you for arranging everything for today. It's all yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Margaret. I'm very excited to be speaking uh, as part of this program, Seeking uh, uh, Facts uh, Through Truth. Uh, and I think it's uh, really important to get a grasp of uh, why semiconductors are so important uh, in US-China relationship. I can't be more excited to be joined by this panel of experts, two of whom are uh, very much technology experts, and then the other two can speak through uh, the political dynamics of semiconductors, which are just so important uh, these days. Now, uh, what I will do is to set the stage and give a, a very short 15-minute presentation to just talk through six slides to set the stage on uh, why semiconductors are so important. I'll introduce the panel, I'll ask them some questions, uh, and then welcome welcome uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, now, uh, basically, uh, I think what, um, you know, the, the important thing here is that uh, all of us made a pact uh, before this panel started that this will be a lively discussion, and I'm very confident that we will uh, deliver that sort of lively discussion uh, because uh, this is just uh, an, an exciting group. Um, now, what I'll do is uh, I will start uh, sharing uh, my slides uh, to uh, basically uh, the group. And uh, I wonder if, uh, Margaret, you can quickly confirm that uh, you're able to see the slides here. Okay, uh, very good. I'll talk through uh, six slides about uh, what is important uh, with uh, semiconductors to make three broad points. The first is that uh, US firms are very much leaders in semiconductor technologies, and they depend quite a bit on China as a large market. China is now, the second point is that China is now trying to catch up a great deal on semiconductors. In my view, it has quite a lot of the basics figured out, but it is behind uh, often very substantially in nearly every single area, especially in equipment uh, as well as in EDA tools which are uh, the tools that you need to design uh, chips. And then the third aspect is that uh, Chinese firms are now trying harder than ever before to try to close this technological gap, to try to catch up on semiconductors. Um, but you know this is a very hard progress process. And so we have to think through about uh, how successful uh, they will be. So let's get into the uh, data. Uh, the first thing, uh, the first point I should make uh, is that uh, semiconductors are really important uh, first as one of the few, uh, you know, remaining uh, very much American strengths in manufacturing. And semiconductors are so important because they underpin pretty much all digital technologies. Without them, uh, it is uh, very difficult to make uh, any digital technology work. Now, uh, in uh, terms of uh, semiconductor technologies, uh, U.S. firms are leaders in uh, most areas. Now, uh, some, uh, US chip companies are not really doing a, a lot of the fabrication work uh, onshore in the United States today, um, but they are still uh, leaders in uh, so many other parts, uh, including in design, including in uh, manufacturing equipment, including in uh, EDA tools. Uh, and then so many of the uh, iconic names in semiconductors are still these uh, big American firms. 
Now, um, the uh, interesting point about uh, you know so much of the semiconductor market is that quite a bit of sales uh, go to China. If we take a look at the major semiconductor firms, uh, names like uh, Intel, names like uh, AMD, Broadcom, for each of these firms, uh, China is either their largest market or the fastest growing market. Now, I hasten to add, this is not uh, all end use uh, demand uh, from China. A lot of chips are exported to China uh, and then assembled into different products like smartphones and then re-exported. Uh, so this is not necessarily end use demand, but uh, around one third to one half of all semiconductors uh, exported to China are uh, consumed in China. Now, if you take a look at the uh, equipment, which is the uh, which are the tooling that you need to actually manufacture chips, China is a large market uh, as well as a growing market. Uh, there's a much uh, clearer trend in terms of the semiconductor equipment uh, industry uh, from uh, names like KLA Tencore, Applied Materials, uh, and LAM Research. That China is a growing uh, and uh, growingly important uh, market for each of them, and that is a little bit more representative of uh, Chinese uh, demand. Uh, now, what's actually going on in China's uh, semiconductor equipment market? Um, well, there's a lot more increase of uh, China's uh, chip capacity. China's uh, semiconductor efforts ramped up in 2014 after uh, the Chinese government released uh, the National uh, Integrated Circuit Guidelines. It ramped up again in 2015, uh, which was the year of the release of the Made in China 2025 plan, which listed semiconductors as the very top item that China really needs to figure out uh, in terms of uh, broader technologies. And uh, what we can see is that uh, quite a lot more chips are being produced in China today. Um, now, some of that is uh, multinational firms, uh, firms like TSMC or Intel or Samsung that are, uh, that are manufacturing in China, but the Chinese headquartered firms are also growing uh, in terms of their capacity to make uh, quite a lot more uh, semiconductors. And so I'll give a very brief review of uh, what I think are the uh, important uh, uh, developments in China's semiconductor uh, industry uh, today, just in terms of uh, very broad strokes uh, where China's industry is uh, in terms of a lot of very uh, different uh, segments. Now, China, I think, uh, in my view, has figured out a lot of the basics of semiconductor technologies, but they are behind on pretty much every single front, sometimes by many years, sometimes by decades. Now, uh, in terms of the important segments, China is now roughly competitive uh, in a lot of different parts of assembly and packaging, but that's fairly low value. Uh, in terms of design, China is also getting uh, developing some uh, nicer, more sophisticated capabilities. So uh, Huawei's uh, high silicon unit, which designs uh, Huawei's uh, phone chips, has now become a more competent uh, outfit. Uh, it's becoming a quite good outfit. Uh, and if you take a look at the broader segment of China's uh, chip industry, there are a lot more upstarts uh, who are trying to produce uh, leading chips, basically, uh, on, on, on the designs. If you take a look at the uh, actual manufacturing capabilities of China's semiconductor sector, they are uh, quite a few years uh, behind. China's uh, technology leader in terms of manufacturing is SMIC, SMIC, uh, Shanghai-based foundry, and uh, it is currently producing at 14 nanometers, uh, which is where the industry leader TSMC reached around five years ago. So in the most generous cut, I think it's fair to say that uh, SMIC is uh, around five years behind TSMC, the market leader uh, in Taiwan. Now, if you take a look uh, basically at memory, this is again where China has made uh, some uh, nice progress uh, in terms of 3D NAND, uh, which is a type of memory chip. Uh, there is a now fairly credible competitor, namely YMTC based in Wuhan, uh, which has made uh, some uh, progress in terms of 3D NAND. But if you take a look at the more valuable segment of DRAM, uh, China is uh, quite a bit more behind. Uh, there, it is a little bit more difficult to see uh, such good uh, evidence of progress. Uh, and that is uh, more challenging and also uh, more valuable. Where China is uh, very substantially behind is uh, the ter in terms of uh, a lot of the equipment, a lot of the met metrology, uh, lithography tools that actually produce semiconductors. They don't really have the capacity to design the software to really uh, go through uh, and um, you know, uh, do a lot of the hard parts of semiconductors. And it's going to be a little bit more difficult given US controls. 
Now, um, the uh, US uh, government has uh, overhauled its export control uh, regime after the passage of the Export Control Reform Act in 2018. And it's becoming a little bit more difficult for ch uh, Chinese firms to acquire uh, leading uh, US technologies. Now, um, in addition to overhauling the broad regulatory regime, the US government has also issued specific regulatory actions against particular Chinese firms. So these include uh, Fujian Tinghua, uh, these include Huawei, uh, Hike Vision, uh, who are all on the entity list. And now the entity list designated firms uh, include a very substantial uh, proportion of uh, Chinese companies. We know that there uh, is a, uh, in, a, a restriction on SMIC's ability to acquire uh, uh, American technologies and uh, executive orders from the White House has also restricted the operations of uh, Tencent's WeChat and ByteDance's uh, TikTok. So uh, there are uh, particular actions uh, taken against uh, Chinese firms, as well as a broader overhaul of the uh, regulatory regime in the US. Uh, according to data from the Department of Commerce uh, in 2019, after the passage of the Export Control Reform Act, a lot more US companies are finding a tougher time in actually acquiring the licenses to export to China. And uh, after uh, Commerce makes a determination on which technologies are emerging and which technologies are foundational, uh, I expect it's going to be a, a lot more difficult yet. There will be a lot more uh, technologies caught under the control of this uh, regulatory regime. Uh, and that's making uh, Chinese companies uh, quite a lot more nervous. Uh, now, uh, I think the um, biggest victim of U.S. actions has been uh, uh, Huawei. I think we, we we're familiar with the uh, basics of what that company does. Um, I'll just uh, briefly mention that Huawei is a major producer of uh, mobile infrastructure equipment, the equipment that uh, we need for uh, 4G as well as uh, 5G. Last year in 2019, it was the world's largest vendor for uh, mobile infrastructure equipment. And Huawei is a very large uh, vendor of smartphones. Uh, and uh, last year was the second largest uh, vendor of smartphones. For a hot minute this year, uh, Huawei was also uh, the world's uh, largest, uh, was in fact the world's largest uh, vendor of smartphones in the second quarter when its sales uh, did not collapse as uh, much as the uh, other firms. Um, Huawei is, uh, in my view, China's most important technology company, in part because its high silicon unit has uh, figured out a lot of, uh, has developed a lot of semiconductor uh, design capabilities. Um, according to one ranking of the world's uh, largest uh, semiconductor firms by revenue, uh, Huawei was uh, the first Chinese company to enter that ranking, again, uh, very, very briefly uh, before uh, it's run into uh, very substantial difficulties. Uh, Huawei's, com uh, Huawei's um, uh, problems are really intensified in May 2019, May last year, when the Commerce Department designated it to the entity list. Now, um, Huawei, uh, I thought, was going to have uh, pretty substantial problems after it joined the entity list. But in 2019, actually, it did uh, fairly OK. So I think that's down to two broad reasons. Uh, first of all, the company engaged in a crash program to really try to improve its uh, capabilities and to have fewer dependencies on American products, uh, especially on semiconductors. So over the course of a single phone design cycle, it was actually uh, pretty uh, impressive at uh, de-Americanizing a lot of its products and trying to figure out uh, a lot of its uh, own uh, technologies. But I think far more important is that Huawei was still able to acquire substantial amounts of US technologies. Now, I won't uh, explain this particular chart in great depth, um, but I think it uh, suffices to say that uh, for the most part, if you are able to produce offshore, uh, then uh, in terms of semiconductors, there was a good chance that you can continue selling to Huawei uh, without seeking a license from the US Department of Commerce. If you are a semiconductor company who is able to manufacture in, let's say, Taiwan, or Israel or Ireland, then there was a good chance that uh, you were able to continue making sales to Huawei. Uh, now, the US Department of Commerce uh, took a look at that situation and uh, basically closed that avenue for uh, continuing to make sales. And uh, you know, I think the uh, interesting thing here is that uh, in uh, this year, uh, Commerce released two highly complex and novel regulations that is going to make it much more difficult for uh, Huawei to acquire any semiconductors that are produced on the basis of American technology, which is pretty much all advanced, uh, all advanced semiconductors in the world. So Huawei is now in pretty substantial uh, trouble. 
its uh, company executive has said that Huawei is now uh, in survival mode. Uh, I understand that it has a stockpile of chips that can see its space stations through, uh, probably uh, in the, through the first half of uh, 2021, uh, but it's already beginning to wind down its shipment of uh, smartphones. Uh, so it's in a fairly substantial problem uh, right now. Okay, so uh, to move on to the final third of my presentation, uh, what is going to happen in China? What has the Chinese response been? Well, the Chinese response uh, hasn't been to uh, do onto American firms uh, what the US government has done onto Huawei. So uh, the uh, Chinese government has not in fact uh, really tried to uh, strike very hard against firms like Apple or Boeing or Cisco or Qualcomm. Uh, instead, it's been fairly restrained. Um, now, I won't get into that here. I encourage questions on that. Uh, so, uh, but you know, uh, we, we we can talk through more about that about that about um, this perspective uh, from Beijing. More importantly, China is now trying very very hard to uh, catch up very substantially on uh, semiconductors. Uh, in the just concluded. And, um, uh, General Secretary Xi uh, said that uh, you know technology is now very very important. In a speech just released in Tioshi, which is uh, the party's main theory magazine, he called for a backup uh, industrial system and called for reliable technologies. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, China is going to be making a lot more investment uh, in uh, fab capacity uh, than anyone else, uh, even more than Taiwan uh, and Korea. The interesting thing to note is that this is not just a state effort uh, at this point. Uh, what I detect is that there is a lot more private industry uh, interest in doing a lot more on uh, different types of technologies. Chinese industrial policy has always been a mixed uh, bag of results. It hasn't necessarily always been very successful. And I think the fundamental problem there is that the Chinese government was counting on Chinese companies to buy obviously inferior uh, technologies for a political purpose. Um, but now there is a lot more uh, private sector um, intent on cultivating uh, basically more reliable supply, I think mostly driven by actions uh, from the US government. So now we can see uh, is that a lot more private companies are jumping into the uh, chip company game. Uh, BYD, an electric vehicle maker, has promised to uh, design more of its own chips. Uh, GRI, which is a home appliance maker that makes things like air conditioners and refrigerators, has also uh, promised to uh, design more of its own chips. And so what I notice is that uh, there's now much more of a whole of society effort in China to really try to figure out a, a lot more of the very fundamental technologies, uh, namely semiconductors, so that they uh, are uh, much more able to uh, depend on supply. Now, uh, what I uh, have uh, noticed is that you know, um, just talking to different firms in China, I'm based in Beijing, uh, one uh, US multinational in uh, manufacturing told me that his companies are starting to ask questions to audit uh, his uh, products for American content so that they're not subject to American jurisdiction. What I've also heard from uh, a company in the semiconductor uh, materials space is that uh, you know, they're getting a little bit more nervous that Chinese companies that never really had an incentive to switch away to untested products is now thinking a little bit more about whether they should uh, give some procurement uh, to untested uh, products. And so, you know, to editorialize a little bit here, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the U.S. mostly reacted to the technological rise of uh, the USSR and uh, Japan by investing a lot more in itself and by doing a lot more R&D. And it's mostly reacting so far to the technological rise of China by trying to cripple China's leading firms. So instead of realizing its own Sputnik moment, uh, the U.S. is triggering one in China. Now, um, is uh, all of this uh, likely to succeed, uh, especially in semiconductors? I would say that uh, in the longer term, I am uh, somewhat constructive that China will figure out uh, quite a lot of the basics of uh, semiconductors, but that's a question for the panel and uh, we will discuss that uh, question uh, very actively. Uh, what I would point out uh, is a, a few things, which is that, no country has uh, monopolized a key technology uh, in the longer run. Uh, this was not the case when the United Kingdom was the uh, leading industrial power in the 18th century. Technology tends to diffuse, uh, that's what it does. 
uh, I've uh, said this at uh, Asia Society before, um, but you know, I, I used to work uh, in California. The saying that we have there is that knowledge travels at the speed of beer, uh, beer or coffee, uh, pick or poison. Basically, engineers tend to chat through these things, and then they uh, tend to figure out uh, a lot of these uh, different problems. China has uh, proven itself uh, capable at mastering at least a few technologies. Uh, it is still a growing market, uh, and it is uh, has a lot of uh, uh, capabilities already. And if I'm thinking through uh, basically the early history of semiconductors when it developed uh, in the uh, 1960s, that was driven very significantly by the military defense complex, which only uh, sought performance uh, and not necessarily cost effectiveness. And that's sort of the situation that uh, China's leading uh, technology company Huawei is in today. It has plenty of cash on hand. It just wants semiconductors that work uh, and it is willing to pay and to you know, provide the uh, uh, demand for a lot of uh, Chinese uh, leading chips. Um, but still, uh, this is going to be a, a very, very tough challenge. Uh, I don't think that uh, this is going to be met uh, anytime soon. This is not something that China can figure out uh, in a matter of uh, months, in a matter of years that it's more likely a matter of decades. Um, but still, uh, you know, big holes of demand tend not to be uh, unfilled for now uh, for very long. It might be the case that Japanese or European firms uh, provide a lot of these technologies to China, or it might be US firms that uh, manage to offshore some of their production. Um, but it could also be the case that uh, a lot of this is driven by uh, Chinese firms. Uh, a lot of the private sector now is investing very heavily in these technologies because there is obvious uh, demand there. Um, with that, let me conclude this presentation on uh, basically to share the data on what's going on with uh, this uh, with uh, China and uh, US uh, in terms of semiconductors. And let's move on uh, to our panel. So I'm very excited to be joined uh, by this panel of experts. Uh, we try to make this uh, balanced, uh, both in terms of uh, technology folks, uh, as well as uh, policy folks. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to talk to, uh, first of all, uh, Jimmy Goodrich, uh, who is the uh, Vice President for uh, Global Policy at the Semiconductor Industry Association. Uh, second, Derek Scissors, uh, who is a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute Third, uh, Willie Shi, uh, who is a professor of uh, uh, at uh, a professor at Harvard Business School, and uh, Cleet Willems, who is partner at Aiken Gump, uh, who uh, a, a DC uh, law firm. So um, these are all uh, uh, great folks, and um, I'm uh, excited to uh, chat with all of you. Um, so first, I think uh, I'll ask a question to uh, Jimmy Goodrich. Uh, Jimmy, uh, I wonder if you can tell us about Know, how U.S. industry is thinking through uh, China's uh, technology capabilities in terms of semiconductors today, and why it will be very, very difficult for China to catch up uh, in terms of uh, all these semiconductor technologies. Thanks, Dan, and a pleasure to be here. You covered just about everything, so um, I could just stop here and say, read Dan's analysis or his presentation, but happy to add some additional thoughts. Um, so China, as you outlined, is the world's largest market for semiconductor consumption. For U.S. semiconductor companies, it's about 23 to 35% of their sales are, occur in China. Uh, and it's the fastest growing market. And if you look at the market structure itself, roughly about half of U.S. chip, chip sales to China are to multinationals like Apple, HP, Dell. And then half of that are to Chinese OEMs like uh, Xiaomi, Oppo, Lenovo, et cetera. So it's a fast growing market, it's super important. And for US semiconductor companies who today are the world leaders in chip design and chip sales and chip equipment, EDA, that revenue is super important because roughly a fifth of US semiconductor revenues reinvested back into research development. That totals Dan 40 billion annually in research development expenditures by US chip firms. It's the lifeblood of their innovation that they use to stay ahead of their competitors. And that R&D intensity uh, amongst US chip firms is uh, much higher than any of, their, of our competitors, including those in South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Europe, especially in China, who is the at currently mo least most uh, R&D intensive uh, semiconductor industry globally. So I'd argue China is, you know, today has been, will be extremely important for the future of the semiconductor industry. And that's exactly why these geopolitical tensions um, between the U.S. and China um, are, are, are a major and significant event. You know, clearly China uh, is investing significantly. This predated, you know, 
the Trump administration, as you outlined in 2014 with their national IC plan. China then actually set up its own $21 billion national chip fund. Um, and so it's pretty obvious, China has ambitions to be bigger uh, and stronger in the semiconductor industry. But I think one key important uh, point you, you made is that no one company or country really has the capability to dominate the entire supply chain. So while um, Xi Jinping in his most recent article you noted talked about a complete domestic backup supply chain, that's gonna come at a significant and uh, uh, extraordinary cost uh, to China's economy if they're truly seeking to do that across every segment of the supply chain. And in many cases, as you, as you pointed out, it could take decades, for example, in some of the more extreme areas of technology like UV lithography uh, for China to actually try and uh, complete their own system. Clearly, the best way for China and any other country to work in this industry is to um, compete where you have a comparative advantage. Um, that's clearly not what China wants to do. It's not in their plan. Um, and the United States might have different ideas for where they want China to be in the semiconductor industry as well. But clearly for US chip companies, important market, it's going to remain an important market for the you know, foreseeable future. Oh, very good. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, Cleet, I heard there's an election tomorrow. Uh, so I wonder if you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, what could happen in a potential second uh, Trump term what might happen if uh, Vice President uh, Biden joins the uh, White House? Uh, and uh, you know, if uh, there is a Biden victory, what could happen in this lame duck period for the next two months? Sure, Dan, uh, thanks for the, the question and, and thanks for having me on, on the panel. You know, I think the key takeaway for everyone uh, should be that you know, the China policy that the US is adopting right now and the overall policy um, on technology with respect to China, you know, is not a President Trump thing. It, it, it is not based on his preferences or even the preferences of this administration. It's really a trend in American policymaking that is going to be with us no matter what happens in this election. Now, there might be different ways uh, that the strategy is carried out, but the general themes are going to be there and, and they're going to persist moving forward. Let me just, I think, you know, by way of introduction and my first set of remarks, really just kind of go through, I think, three important points for people. Um, you know, number one, why do policymakers on both the right and the left see Huawei and these other Chinese companies as a threat? And why are they advocating for this? What have we been doing? What's working? What's not? And then talk a little bit, as you asked, Dan, about the lame duck. I mean, first, I think it's important to level set, you know, why is this a threat? Well, I think there's really three buckets uh, three aspects to that. I mean, one is the pure national security side of things. And there's the evidence, some of which is public, much of which is not public, um, that, that, that we had when I was in the White House, backdoors and different things that these companies like Huawei are involved in. Um, but putting aside the non-public information, the public way that the U.S. articulates this is pretty straightforward. And it's that companies like Huawei um, have linkages to the military or they're part of the larger Chinese military civilian complex. They're subject to China's national intelligence law. And therefore, if the Chinese government asks, they are going to provide access and information um, that, that that government may use for national security reasons. And that argument you hear again, you hear it from people on the right, whether it's the president or Marco Rubio, people on the left like Mark Warner, that pure national security threat. Then there's the economic, and that's this question of competition. You know, who's going to be the leader uh, in 5G? Who's going to dominate technologies of the future? Um, but I think that's also coupled with this issue of China's willingness to engage in unfair practices to get there. The intellectual property theft, the subsidization, the Made in China 2025 plan. So that's sort of the economic component of it that I think you know is right up there with the national security component. And then you get to the rule of law issues. And everyone has to remember the reason Huawei was put on the entity list in the first place wasn't for either of the two reasons I just mentioned. It's because they were violating sanctions. They were violating sanctions on Iran. So you have all these three components that put Huawei squarely in the crosshairs, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. And a lot of the same logic would apply to other Chinese technology companies. Now, what, what is the strategy for dealing with this? Um, well, when I was in the White House and with this administration, we really put together a three-part strategy. 
And I think one can argue, and I'll argue, <laughs> that some elements of that strategy have been carried out more effectively than others, and some are purely lagging. But what was the strategy? Well, part one was the protection, and that was the export controls and the CFIUS. Uh, and, and other actions like that. And I think the, the argument can be made that it has been effective. And Dan, you walked through a lot of the numbers in terms of what's happening with Huawei and the fact that they do feel like they're under siege right now and just trying to survive. Um, but I would argue that it hasn't been nearly nuanced enough. And an argument I try to make, including on behalf of the industry, is that the optimal national security outcome is not to do, not, to not do business with them at all, but on non-national security sensitive items, isn't it better for America if China's buying our stuff and therefore subsidizing our own technological dominance? So let's make this nuance, get revenue from China where we can so we remain the innovation leader, but only wall off where you really need to. Um, you know, the second part of this was the multilateral component, which I think the administration can point to success and countries around the world starting to turn their back on not only Huawei, but other Chinese technology companies. I mean, Sweden, I think, who most say is the least protectionist country in the world, recently said they're not gonna have Huawei or ZTE in their networks. You know, obviously Australia has been a leader, India has been a leader. So the US has made some success there, but I also think particularly on the export control side, what we've seen is when we act unilaterally, it hurts our companies vis-a-vis -vis their international competitors. And so I think, you know, even though the U.S. is making some progress, they need to do a better job where they do decide that that protection is warranted to actually coordinate it internationally, multilaterally. Um, the third element to it, and I think probably the area where we're doing the worst, uh, is the question of running faster and actually having our own um, subsidies and different, and, you know, some people would even say industrial policy for our companies. And that has been lagging way behind. And it really, I think, is unfair for us to be shutting all these markets down for our companies and then not helping them out at the same time. And the U.S. needs to do a much better job on that. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I think there are some efforts underway through our National Defense Authorization Act and other things, but probably not enough and there needs to be more. And I can see Jimmy nodding his head. <laughs> um, so I think that is clear, but that is what the strategy was intended to be. And like I said, I think the implementation has been uneven. Some successes we can point to other areas where it's not going as well. I would, however, though, I would take a little bit of exception with Dan said about we're creating their Sputnik moment. This, they've been trying to subsidize this industry. They've been trying to create this industry for years. Um, are they still trying to do so today? Yes, but I saw the fifth plenum stuff as a lot of sort of doubling down on existing policies rather than the novel creation of new ones. So the last point, just bringing you to sort of the the, the Biden Trump dynamic. Um, and, you know, again, I think Biden historically may not have gone down this path. So if the US wasn't in this position, maybe he doesn't run in this direction quite as quickly as Trump has. However, I think the external policy constraints in Washington right now and the bipartisan support for this stuff is so extreme that I think Biden's ability to maneuver is gonna be quite limited. And the example I love to give is you know, basically I, you know, when the US took action on ZTE, which was the strongest sanctions penalties that we had ever imposed on any com company ever, uh, the Hill said it was too weak. And um, on Huawei, they're basically passing riders saying you can never take them off the entity listing and, unless you jump through all these different hoops. So you have the Hill flanking the Trump administration. I think that's gonna force Biden's hand. I think the Democrats are gonna be in a similar place as Republicans on this stuff. I think you will have a more predictable policymaking environment. I think you will have more of an interagency process that you have. You may have more efforts to coordinate internationally, but the policy trajectory is similar. Um, last point, lame duck, what am I looking for? Um, the theory that's out there, and I tend to agree with it, although I will acknowledge it's pure speculation, is that if Trump loses, lame duck, is the last you know, chance for his administration to really try to enshrine these policies. Do I think that's true? Well, you know, I actually called a friend pretty high up at the White House last week and I said, hey, everyone in industry is saying, lame duck's gonna be crazy. What do you think? Are you guys planning that? And he said, honestly, we haven't talked about it. He said, is it true that the Hawks have a whole bunch of stuff lined up that they wanna you know, 
push through? And do I think they're going to try to take advantage of lame duck? Absolutely. Um, but the president hasn't spoken to it. We don't know what his mood's going to be. We don't know if he's going to be busy contesting the election for two months. So I can't really tell you what's going to happen. Um, so that was the view of people actually on the inside. What I would say, though, is I do think that the Hawks are going to really want to push here because they are skeptical of the U.S. establishment. Even though I think things are not going to go back to the 2016 uh, situation, people on the NSC, people in the State Department, the Hawks, they're skeptical and they want to make sure that this policy can't be rolled back. And I think they're going to try to push through the things that they've been on the doorstep of. More entity listings, I think especially for companies listed on DOD's Section 1237 list of Chinese communist military companies. I think you're going to see a whole lot of those attempted to be added to the entity list. I, I do think the SMIC um, you know, could turn into an entity listing. The view is you know, we've plugged, we, we hit Huawei ourselves. We plugged some loopholes with the, the, in the third countries with the foreign direct product rule. And now we got to hit them domestically where they're going to get that source of supply. And so SMIC is, is high on the list. I do think you're going to see more sanctions actions. Um, both Hong Kong and Xinjiang, I think, are possibilities. I think that um, you know, the ICTS supply chain final rule that's been sort of at the doorstep for a while could be pushed through. Um, and you know, a couple other things. I don't think the China phase one deal is in jeopardy, but I, I am watching those other things very closely for lame duck. So I'll stop there. Hopefully that was a helpful framework about why we're concerned, what we tried to do, some of it more effectively than others, and what I think the path forward is, including in the short term. Great. Uh, Willie, uh, you've heard uh, Cleet say that this is going to be a uh, decoupling is going to be a trend in American policymaking. Uh, there's going to be a lot more efforts to hit Chinese uh, firms. Uh, can you talk about you know, what decoupling means for uh, the U.S.? I know you spend a lot of time visiting different factories and logistics zones in uh, Asia. Um, you know, can you speak to a little bit about, you know, give us some gory details about why decoupling is difficult and how does industry think about this? Uh, well, Dan, you know, I'm a little skeptical and I would argue that recent trade numbers really verify that, okay? Because, uh, you know, China spent a long time moving supply chains in, right? I remember the times in the late 90s and early 2000s where China was mainly an assembly operation where they would, uh, you know, uh, you'd have logistics providers who would kit components, send them into uh, import processing zones, and they would primarily do assembly work and then ship stuff back out. Okay. And they embarked on a long-term strategy to relocate those supply chains and move them uh, close to the assembly sites. Uh, a is a way of capturing more value add moving up the value chain, okay? And, you know, they dangled a lot of incentives there, including, you know, access to the domestic market, local content rules and things like that. So they've done a good job on capturing the supply chain. Now, when you want to move out, uh, you know, what, what China has clearly demonstrated in uh, uh, most of this year has been their ability to restart manufacturing after the pandemic, the, uh, the, their ability to uh, get uh, the, those supply chains moving again, their ability to manage through those conditions. Okay, what we're seeing right now on the Trans-Pacific is like uh, record volumes, right? Container shortages, you know, air cargo limitations as everybody is rushing back to China, the easy, easy solution, right? And, and that's more broadly, not just electronics okay but uh you know in my mind is the question of will manufacturers be able to escape uh the gravitational pull of china okay and you know will they reach escape velocity will they be able to move to vietnam will they be able to move to other low-cost regions mexico you know india what have you okay and i'd say the the numbers that we're seeing in the last couple of weeks suggest no now when I look at semiconductors in particular, you know, uh, here I, I'd have to agree with some of the things that Cleet said. Okay, I mean, I think what we have done, and I, I think the turning point really came with ZTE a couple of years ago, right? Because that sent a clear message that I cannot, if I'm a Chinese 
manufacturer, I cannot depend on American suppliers. Okay, and it actually goes back before that because we've weaponized a lot of other things. Like we've weaponized SWIFT, we've weaponized a lot of other things, okay? And so, you know, if you're a Chinese manufacturer and you see what's happening to Huawei now and you see what happened to ZTE, I remember being in Shanghai, you know, when uh, everybody would ask me, is like, is the U.S. going to let ZTE survive, okay? And there were tens of thousands of jobs at stake then. So what we have done is we have given them we have put them on notice that you cannot depend on U.S. suppliers. Now, to Cleet's point, is that good for us? Uh, or Jimmy's point as well, is that good for us? Is that bad for us? Okay. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of criticism about Huawei, but I will say they have good engineers and they're willing to invest in engineers. Okay, so if we, uh, if we force... Huawei to go out of business, where do you think those guys are going to go, right? I'll tell you where they're going right now. They're going to other companies to try to upgrade the skills, all right? You know, High Silicon was a very capable operation. I've seen, you know, uh, I've seen a number of Huawei's manufacturing operations. These guys are good. They invest in engineering, okay? And they're very, very good, okay? So then the question is, where are those capabilities going to go and is the U.S. strategy really going to be effective in the long term, or are we just going to fragment Huawei into capabilities that are going to spread all over and pose a much bigger competitive threat over time? So from a strategy standpoint, uh, I don't think it's a very good strategy. Uh, but, you know, this is to Cleet's point, uh, I, I've been saying as well that the answer on these things is we have to run faster and we do have to invest more in innovation. Right? And uh, so I, I'm skeptical at the current rate and pace that the US is investing in semiconductors. Uh, and I, I visited a couple of fabs recently and uh, it really gave me a lot of focus on what kind of investment would it take to keep up in this race. We don't have the will in this country to do that. Right? I, I floated a number in Washington in terms of what kind of investment I thought it was gonna take for the US to regain the lead at seven nanometer, five nanometer and so on. It took people's breath away. I, I don't think we have the will to do that. Okay, and we can look beyond the semiconductor industry and see, you know, if you want to see something that the U.S. has zero capability in, that China is going to walk away with the whole thing. Look at LCD flat panel displays. Okay. Uh, we've got nothing there. Okay. Do we depend on that technology all the time? Absolutely. All right. And, and, and by the way, people have been talking about that one for 15 years as that cap capability left the country. So, you know, I, I'm very skeptical that uh, we'll be able to right. decouple like that. Well, let me let me uh, move on then to um, Derek. Um, Derek, how much decoupling have we in fact seen so far? And uh, you know, do you agree with the sentiment of this panel that the U.S. needs to run faster, uh, a, a, a lot more fast? Well, I, you know, I don't think we've seen much decoupling at all. Uh, I disagree with Cleed on the effectiveness of the strategy. Not that he was entirely endorsing it, but I would say it's considerably worse than he said. Um, everyone focuses on tariffs. I'm gonna to get to technology, but let's talk about broader decoupling. Everyone focuses on tariffs. You know, 2019 goods and services trade volume was less than 3% lower than 2016, a $13 billion drop. Against that, US portfolio investment more than doubled from the end of 2016 into China, the end of 2019, $120 billion increase. What's decoupling when you have a $13 billion trade drop? <laughs> and $120 billion increase in US investment in China. I mean, that's just silly. Um, that we're much more coupled with the Chinese on net than we were. Um, now you might say, well, what about technology in particular? Um, export controls, as people know, were passed overwhelmingly by the Congress. It was 402 in the House in the summer of 2018. They were willfully ignored by the Commerce Department. And I will be happy to fight with anyone on here who thinks that's not true. I started saying in 2019, I said, we were not going to get those regulations until the election. We didn't get the regulations until the election. We aren't even close. 
on the entity list, uh, I find largely to be fake. It's a license requirement. It is not a sanction, it doesn't ban anything. Of course, we gave Huawei five uh, temporary general licenses because you know we didn't wanna hurt them too badly, even though they're being accused in federal court of being a criminal enterprise. Um, it was designed at the beginning by some members of the administration to sidetrack the Congress. Uh, I was at a meeting where that happened. Um, many licenses, not really at liberty to say what the proportion is, have been granted. The ICTS rules, which we are going to get and we're going to get and we're going to get, we haven't got those either. Um, there is no technology decoupling. There is a threat of technology decoupling. There is no technology decoupling. Now, having said that, I'm going to flip myself and say we're heading that way, but it's not because of the US. It's not because of tariffs and it's not because of entity list designations and all the fairly silly things we've done uh, in the last few years. It's because of China. Um, and China, as several people have mentioned, and I agree with, um, China is, this is new. It, I, I don't agree with the point that like, oh, we're forcing the Chinese to invest in technology. That's absurd. Uh, the 12 five year plan started this process in 2011, even before Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, of course, accelerated that, made in China 2025. I don't need to go through the history. The Chinese are going to move as quickly as possible in technology, regardless of what we do. Um, and they're going to have to do it through subsidies uh, and, and technology coercion because of the nature of their economy. Um, we're not going to get them to negotiate down the role of SOEs, as we all know here. So we're going to get continued uh, anti-competitive subsidies and continued regulatory protection. It follows from that that they will continue to coerce and steal technology. Why does it follow? Because they're an aging society. Pre-COVID, they were more indebted than the US. I don't think that's true now, but pre-COVID they were. Um, SOEs remain in charge of roughly 20 major sectors. They don't face any competition or any meaningful competition in those sectors, which means they don't innovate, which means the Chinese are gonna be drawing technology from elsewhere, either legally or illegally. Um, so, What's, going, what's happened is not that the US has done very much. We've talked about doing things, we haven't done it. Um, what's happened uh, for a longer period than the Trump administration's talk is seven, eight years of Chinese action. And that action is eventually going to fall because it's not going to change. Xi Jinping isn't going to change, the subsidies aren't gonna change, the technology coercion isn't going to change. That action is eventually going to force the US into being more serious about this. Um, it, not going to do it next year. Next year, I would say, is a, is a honeymoon period. Um, I suppose things could happen in the lame duck, but I agree with whoever was saying uh, we're not very organized. We don't know the president's mindset, so I don't expect anything in the lame duck. I think the beginning of 2021 will get China reaching out to whoever is in charge in the U.S., uh, most likely Vice President Biden, and saying, oh, yeah, you know, we just want a good relationship. But 2022 is the party Congress, and 2023, she's going to have to justify his position and I think we're going to get an increasingly aggressive China, um, not in ec just in economic terms, also in foreign policy terms. And that's where I think US action will become more serious. Um, several people on the panel know the technology race in semiconductors better than I do. And I'm not, I'm not arguing with them about who's going to win and what's necessary to win. What I would say is my point about coming decoupling is that it's not going to be necessarily be about winning. Some people will make that argument but it will be about, we don't wanna do business with this country anymore. That's where Xi Jinping's China is heading, in my opinion. We see that in Hong Kong, we see it in the border dispute with India and so on, on top of the economic predation. So I don't think the US has been serious about this. Uh, maybe my standards are a little too high, but I think Chinese action both within uh, technology and elsewhere in economics and outside of economics are gonna force us to become serious. And what I would say to the people watching, and of course, obviously you may all violently disagree, is uh, you know, 2023, 2024, barring an incident over Taiwan before then, you're going to see much more serious US policy than now, um, likely. And so if you think this is a problem, I, I would urge you to, to change your perspective. What we've done so far is not a problem as witnessed by American money pouring across the Pacific, but I don't think this is sustainable in light of Chinese policy trends. So I think the real decoupling is three years away or so. I'll stop there. Okay. Well, um, I, let me let me put a bit of a finer point. This is um this is a, a part of a, a discussion. I'm, I'll put a bit of a finer point about what I, I said. I think 
you know, Chinese industrial policy is now different uh, from then in the past. Uh, and, you know, because I think Made in China 2025 is a long path of a, a very long series of different uh, industrial plans. What's different now is that the private sector is now much more aligned uh, with the state, uh, basically in cultivating uh, domestic sources of supply. I think if there weren't these U.S. actions against firms like uh, Huawei, against, uh, you know, the, the slight restriction on uh, SMIC, these Chinese technology firms wouldn't need to work so hard. They would uh, keep buying American technology uh, if, it, if, it, if it weren't uh, the case before. Um, now, I, I think a, a question yeah, to- uh, Can I uh, object to that? Please, go ahead, um, go ahead. There. We just had Xi say, we wanna become more self-reliant. He's been saying it for years. So I don't think even if, you know, I'll keep this short because I don't wanna take over the discussion. I, you know, it's not as if the Chinese government can't coerce the private sector. And it's not as if it's not going to coerce or induce the private sector to be more self-reliant. So, I mean, the American actions here are incidental. They speed things up a little bit. Uh, maybe they focus attention on Huawei as opposed to some other companies, but we've, you know, you're right. The private sector is more interested in Chinese industrial policy now. It wasn't going to be given a choice would be my counter. I would just like to add to that, Dan, I Please. think on the, on, on sort of the state versus private sector investment in China. Certainly there's been a lot of attention like with the star market, there's been a number of listings where the multiples trading of uh, Chinese semiconductor equipment, chip design firms are extremely high. SMIC listed on the Shanghai star market. Although to say that's private capital, I think it's a bit deceiving. If you look at most of the initial investors that are buying shares in companies on the star market, they're state owned. Um, if you look at all the leaders in sectors like memory chip, semiconductor manufacturing tools, photography, materials, EDA, uh, logic, foundry, every single one of the leaders in those segments are state owned. Um, if you look at the 90 plus semiconductor chip, chip fabs that are being built in China, I think actually just about one is, is, is privately financed down in Guangzhou, Can Semi. The vast majority are uh, financed through uh, state, state capital, mostly through local government financing vehicles. Um, I think where you do see an increase in private sector investment is in the fabulous design space. And you might be able to argue that on the other hand, a lot of those companies like Alibaba who set up uh, T-Head Semiconductor, um, like uh, ZTE Microelectronics, others, they're simply following the trends of you know, other hyperscalers like Amazon who's designing their own semiconductors. Uh, I mean, there's so in many cases you can find where it's not, it's not often easy to say uh, what's the reason for those private companies getting into this space? Although more recently, because of the trade war, I think there was a report that thousands of private companies from seafood companies to auto tire um, manufacturers are now moving into the semiconductor business. And I think that's pretty clear because they see the dollar signs of government subsidies that might be there waiting for them if they announce they're not entering into the chip sector. That's, this has kind of been a traditional challenge for Chinese industrial policy. The state tends to have what they believe is a finely crafted plan. They have a small group of hand-picked state-owned enterprises. They want to be the national champions to develop XYZ technology. But then every mayor, every provincial governor, they have their own idea and their own plan. And oftentimes Chinese industrial policy gets overridden by their own overinvestment, particularly down in the provinces. And we're starting to see signs of that. For example, over the last several months, several Chinese chip companies have now gone under are in delinquency. Um, that's still only uh, roughly 9% of China's total fab construction is now in the sort of mothballed phase. Um, but I think it's a sign of things to come in that, look, it's one thing to say you wanna build a semiconductor fab or a leading edge company. It's, an, it's another thing to have the money, but to have the people, the technology and the market bearing to actually make that happen um, is very difficult to do. And to say a sort of, sort of prefecture level city, hundred miles outside of Shanghai with no experience in semiconductors is going to whip out some cash and build a fab and make it competitive. It's actually really hard to do. Um, and, and in fact, you, you've now seen this sort of uh, group of, of uh, roving engineers, um, oftentimes Taiwanese or Korean, that are going from city to city saying, we'll build you a fab, we'll build you a fab. They get money to do it. They run away, uh, end up vacation in Thailand or something. And this has actually caught a lot of attention so much that the NDRC in China last week I said they're going to start cracking down on this practice. Um, so it's interesting to see kind of the investment trends. You know, some are even saying there might be an investment bubble in semiconductors in China, but clearly that's going to continue with the recent 14 five year plan talking about self sufficiency. 
Uh, Willie, so, you, you so, wanted so, to say something about so that. So Dan, I just want to weigh in on that. I mean, in terms of private companies working on it, I mean, couldn't you argue that they see the opportunity because the government is pushing domestic sourcing independent of the US, right? So therefore, a lot more entrants, and as, uh, as Jimmy says, a lot of them will be subsidized. We should, we should distinguish between state-owned and private companies who receive subsidies, right? Because I think while the effect may be the same, you know, th there, there's a distinction uh, distinction in there. I mean, I, I think subsidies are the most pernicious problem that we face, not only in semiconductors, but in many, many other sectors as well. Great. Um, I want to ask a, a question to Cleet and uh, Derek, just in terms of uh, what is now uh, the entity list? Uh, what is that meant to be? So in August, I noticed that Commerce designated 24 companies to the entity list for building islands in the um, South China Sea. A Commerce official immediately briefed the press and said that these uh, 24 companies received uh, $5 million of US exports over the last five years, which is absolutely minuscule. Uh, and so I wonder if the US is now just, you know, what is the entity list? Is that just a catalog of companies that we don't like today? Yeah, let me let me go first, and then because uh, I, I also I, I I've been restraining myself. There's so many comments, I don't even know where to start. Um, I, I do want to make two quick questions, then I'll I promise Dan I'll turn to your entity list question. First, on I, I want to start with what what Jimmy said, um, and and I think what others have, have been talking about here, which is sort of this idea of you know China is doing a lot of stuff. Um, they've been trying to subsidize this industry. They've been trying to catch up. But it's not necessarily all that clear to me how effective they have been or they will be. And I do think that in our policy making, you know, we tend to paint China as like the big bad boogeyman all the time and this existential threat to the United States. And are they the biggest economic and national security threat that we face today? Absolutely, they are. But, you know, we shouldn't just throw our hands up and say, you know, we need to you know, totally forget about the American model and what has made us so great in an effort to try to combat China. And I do fear that in a lot of our policymaking, we are, we are doing that. And so that was just a point I thought was important to make here is I just, I think we overstate the threat of China. As Dan was saying, they're far behind us in a lot of ways. They've got subsidies from these ad hoc companies that may not work anyway. So yes, let's be responsive, but let's be careful. And let's remember um, that you know, they aren't better than us today. I don't think they're gonna be in the next two weeks and so let's make sure our policy is responsive to what it is. Jimmy, did you want to jump in there and just agree? Yeah, I was just saying, Cleek, just to add one point there, I think, um, you know, with like with any Chinese industrial policy, you throw a lot of money at the wall, something's going to stick. And so if you look at the accumulative investment numbers, it's easily over 100 billion since 2015 that the Chinese state has invested into the sector. So you're going to see a tremendous amount of waste and failure. One point I'd like to make is that that in itself can have you know, damaging effects on the global supply chain, you can create a lot of zombie-like artificial capacity that's non-market-based, it's not justified, and you can create wreckage. Like, for example, you saw in other industries like flat panel steel aluminum, where you just have a, a lot of capacity somebody needs to sell and it hurts the industry dynamics. Second, I think in terms of what could stick on the wall, as Dan mentioned, progress in areas like flash memory, YMTC, have actually been pretty remarkable. Um, if you look at, for example, SMIC's business, the majority of it, 90% of the revenue, is not from leading edge. It's from mature technologies that are still very profitable. If you look at your Amazon Echo, your garage door opener, those chips are not made at leading edge processes at TSMC yet. There's a, still a huge market for them. So I think you know, the two, you know, where China is going to be highly competitive is in areas where the process technology is not as demanding, but there's still a huge commercial market. Where, where is the majority of that market? It's in China. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great point. And like I, so like I said, major threat, but let's keep it in perspective. Second point is I wanted to respond to what, what Derek said about decoupling. And, you know, my view is, I don't know whether it's actually going to happen. I mean, that's my honest view. I think it's hard to say at this point. What I do think, and I think is important for people who are listening to this all over the world, is that it is the primary policy primary policy objective of a whole lot of people right now, especially when it comes to, I think, three areas, um, technology, including semiconductors, 
medical, you know, and, and pharmaceutical and everything else that comes along with that. And then the third area where I disagree with Derek is on financial. And he is correct that decoupling has not happened at this stage of the game with respect to US financial flows into China, but it has started to happen quite a bit onto inflows in the United States. And the, the, the guns are out with respect to the outflow. And I would point to you what has already happened with our thrift savings plan in terms of not investing in China, what is likely to happen pretty soon, which is US company or Chinese companies being delisted from US stock exchanges. And then what we're on the precipice of, which is legislation Rubio introduced this week and that others have been talking about, which is saying pension funds shouldn't be investing in a whole range of Chinese companies. So I don't know where that financial flow is going, but I think that is a lot more on people's minds than Derek would give them credit for. But again, with respect to decoupling more broadly, look, the phase one deal was the anti-decoupling agenda item, right? That was supposed to open up China. You know, so I do think for commodities and things like that, you're not gonna see decoupling. I think it's gonna be more targeted. Whether or not it succeeds or not, I think is an open question. But I think we need to talk about it in a slightly more nuanced way. Now, going back to Dan, to your, to your question, the entity list, um, if I can speak bluntly, right now, it's just Please. the favorite toy. It's the easiest toy to use in this administration when it comes to going after the bad guys. And I think a lot of people would argue it's not the best toy. Um, you know, it really was supposed to be, um, you know, for pure national security threats, not for something broader. Um, I think it's being used broader in a way that, mo that sanctions typically would be used. And I think in a lot of cases, people will argue that sanctions would be much more effective. If you really wanna cut off Huawei, you know, why don't you put them on the SDN list instead of on the entity list? I mean, one of the big problems with the entity list is it only deals with exports. And so it also isn't responsive to other companies that are not reliant on US exports. And you see, you know, another thing we're debating right now in the US is you know, should we do something or not with Ad Financial, with Alibaba? You know, an entity listing is on the table, but does that really work? I don't think it does. I think if you wanted to get serious about that, you would go down a different path. So look, I think it's, you know, to put it bluntly, you have Commerce Department officials who are on the hawkish side of the spectrum, who are willing to do these kinds of things. What toys do they have? Well, they've got entity listings. Is it the best toy or the most effective toy? Probably not in quite a few cases. Uh, yeah, the, I know that Cleet is thinking about a couple of people. The Commerce Department is hardly a hawkish organization, a broken organization, maybe it's not hawkish. <laughs> um, and if you looked at the, the, if you, it went, when this information, as I hope comes out, because there is no legal reason for it not to, about the, the licenses that have been granted, uh, as opposed to the licenses that have been rejected, in addition to the export controls, in addition to ICTS, you will see that Commerce can't possibly be effectively hawkish. But I take the point. I agree completely. The entity list is not a real sanction. It's it's a it's a toy um, that was trotted out originally when Congress was on the war path against Huawei, and the administration said, "No, no, no, don't do anything serious. Let's do this instead." Um, and we we continue to do that. Uh, there are other sanctions tools we could take that are superior, including the SD and list at Treasury. And one of the reasons we don't do that is Treasury is actually a pro-China organization, and it has been because it represents the U.S. financial sector traditionally. It's not just this this uh, Trump administration goes back quite a ways. Um, now, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm very suspicious about controlling US portfolio flows in addition to the fact that we've completely failed to do so. So now, if you talk about uh, delisting, uh, it's a much smaller amount of money than the money going directly into Chinese entities. Same thing with the thrift, uh, the, the thrift uh, board. Those are, those are small amounts of money. Uh, and we're spending a lot of time talking about them and we're not doing anything. And we have a, an administration that's supposedly decoupling from China that like the previous administration doesn't even want to enforce US regulation until 2022, because magically it's, a, you know, we don't need to have the rule of law enforced till then. So I don't think, you know, we're going to get the natural progression. We have a lot of talk. Senator Rubio has been trying to pass legislation for several years, never goes through Senate banking. It will not if the Republicans hold the Senate, it might if the Democrats take the Senate. Um, we've had a lot of talk about this stuff, but I, I think we're going to need a galvanizing action. Um, Hong Kong was a step in that direction, the Chinese inter mainland intervention in Hong Kong, partly because it makes Taiwan uh, a much more sensitive issue. So I think we're going to get that galvanizing action, but I don't think we've seen much uh, in the way of real action so far. 
And the entity list is a, is a perfect example. It's a good question to ask, Dan. I mean, all it does is say you have to apply for a license. And if you ask Commerce, well, you don't have to identify any company, but how many licenses you rejected, they'll claim they, they can't answer that. It's not true, um, but that's what they claim. So we would need um, for, for quicker movement, uh, for the entity list to become a real tool, we need a different Department of Commerce. And I agree with Cleet, um, there are other tools that are better. And for those, we need a different Department of the Treasury. And maybe we'll get that in the next administration. I doubt it. I think it will be forced upon us rather than the US going there voluntarily. Well, Dan, just wanted to add one just, point, if I can. Okay, quick. I just think okay. on, you know, on the entity list and export controls, it's really important to point out that the vast majority of these actions have been unilateral in nature, meaning that the United States is the only country in the world that continues to place these companies on their entity list. Many other countries don't even have an entity list, particularly those that are important mm -hmm. in the semiconductor industry. And so what you have, with the exception of Huawei, because of the foreign direct product rule, is much more complete in its restriction, as you pointed out. Um, when it was expanded in August 17 of this year. But what you have for the vast majority of every other entity listing is US exporters are put at a major disadvantage because their competitors in Europe, Japan, South Korea can continue to ship to them unabated, no restriction whatsoever. So what does that do? That just means less money in the pocket of US companies, but more importantly, the national security objective is not even achieved because the technology the US government does not want to go to those entities flows from one of our you know, allied or or non-allied partners. So what's really important is multilateral, is working with allies. I think there's a real opportunity for the United States to work with its allies, to reform uh, things like the Wassenaar arrangement, um, to you know, have a, you know honest and, and real discussion about um, you know, sensitive technologies, about export control, because at the end of the day, they need to work together to be effective. And that also helps uh, limit the negative blowback on the US industrial base. One of the key aspects of the ECRA legislation that uh, reformed export controls in 2018 was that BIS has to consider what the economic impact of those controls will be on the domestic industry. And yes, you might be able to achieve that national security objective, but at what cost? Have you displaced in a US industry entirely? Have you um, significantly eroded their ability to invest in research development? And all of those are really important factors that have to take into account. Um, just one final point, I think, you know, we need to talk more about running faster. What should the United States be doing? To not think about, as uh, one Chinese expert commented to me, uh, the Tanya Harding strategy of kneecapping, it's always a better strategy to run faster in the race, to be a better athlete, uh, able to um, outrun your competition. And as, and as Willie has pointed out, we're just simply not doing enough. Um, and we could easily be investing more, both in domestic manufacturing, um, but that's not the only solution. The second half, of course, is investing in basic research development in our workforce. Because at the end of the day, it's nice to have more fabs, but you need to have the technology to power them. So, you know, I think this is an area which is a no-brainer for, um, you know, whomever the next administration is, doubling down on basic research um, R&D, doubling down on supply chain investments in a way that are still American uh, in terms of letting the market still determine the outcomes and not the government picking winners. I think we can do that, balancing sort of a light touch industrial policy uh, with our free market principles. Jim, so, I just have to ask Jimmy a question. There, I, I want to support this industry and I want to run faster and all those things you're talking about. There is no way that I can go to a member of Congress and say, take taxpayer money and give it to a chip firm when the chip firm is free to, at the same time, be investing more in China, right? Or if an American financial is investing in the chip industry in China, so when, when, all of, when everybody here talks about running faster, it's a great point, and I won't belabor this, we can't be running faster and using taxpayer money and mobilizing resources and the challenge that Willie points out that maybe we don't have the nerve to spend the money if we're simultaneously still willing to provide the Chinese with technology and capital, which is what we're doing now. Because Derek, we well, have well, well in, in the chip sector though, I think, you know, just one final point, um, mm -hmm. that's actually not true. You know, if you look at U.S. semiconductor capital expenditures over the last 20 years, um, we actually went through and looked through both mm -hmm. commerce data and public reporting data. There's a blog post on our website that explains this. Less than 5% of U.S. capital expenditures um, for semiconductor companies has been in China. The vast majority, um, 40, roughly 47%, has been in the United States. That's why the U.S. is still uh, roughly 12% of semiconductor production, our fourth largest export, 
Uh, and, you know, when there has been investment overseas, it's been in allied nations like Singapore, um, Israel, other areas that are, you know, strong protection of IP and good partners to the U.S. So, you know, would we'll disagree with that, but anyhow. Well, Dan, I, mean, you okay, wanted to I, I, I think just, um, at this point, I think um, I should just mention that um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's about uh, time that we uh, have to move on to audience questions. I think it's, uh, it's fair to take on a couple of these um, audience questions. Um, but, Dan, I mean, can I, maybe can I make one comment quickly? I All right, one, one more comment, please. Yeah, yeah. One comment is, look, I agree with Jimmy on the multilateral point, but I think we need to be realistic about how difficult that is. Yes. Getting Europe to step up, getting Japan to step up, getting Korea and everyone else to actually do this stuff is really hard. And I was talking earlier about some of the progress we made, but the amount of blood, sweat and tears that took for the U.S. administration to get it done was quite a bit. So they, you know, the other countries need to be more ambitious. My second point is we need to stop seeding the national security arguments and assuming that decoupling is the best answer for national security. As I was saying before, the best answer for U.S. national security is to be the strongest and most innovative economy in the world. That's how we remain dominant over China. And if we can get China to subsidize our sales, that's great. We should do that. That helps us beat them. And last thing I'm going to say is Derek's right that just handouts for people to build plants in China is not a good idea. But how about handouts to build plants in America? That's what I'm talking about. I think that's what Jimmy's talking about, too. So if we do it in the right way... I think it can be effective. And so, um, again, I just wanted to jump in. Thank you, Dan. Dan, 30 <laughs> well, seconds. Quick point, Willie. OK. Uh, most of what I hear about restoring American competitiveness in this sector is all about working on the supply side. OK, my argument has been focused on the demand side. Back in the 60s, you know, when US semiconductors were preeminent is because NASA and DOD bought 60% of them for the space program, right? And stuff like that, okay? I, I think as long as we're gonna spend so much on infrastructure coming up, right? There's real opportunity to create the demand which will then attract the investment and really, you know, drive the, a virtuous cycle in that regard. Okay, so we're going to move on to audience Q&A and then we'll try to tackle as many of them as I can. Uh, as I can. And um, uh, encouragement to the audience to please type in your question in the Q&A box. Um, the first question I'll ask uh, the panel, uh, I, I guess this is for everyone. Um, how would you characterize the threat of corp uh, corporate espionage and uh, thievery of know-how in the IC market? What have you guys observed? And you know, how likely is corporate espionage uh, 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 able to uh, uh, help China's ability to make chips? Depends what you call espionage. Okay, is it going to Taiwan and offering to triple people's salary if they come work in China? You know, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, California has such a good example in that regard in terms of, uh, you know, non-compete agreements. Okay, but you know, the problem is people are pursuing opportunity. I, th I see that as the biggest leakage path for know-how. Right. Well, um, I can, uh, you know, I, just to share some, um, you know, anecdotal evidence on that um, in terms of um, hiring people. I understand that SMIC built a church for one of its uh, executives, a Taiwanese executive, you know, communist country building a church on premise uh, to, to lure one of its executives over. Uh, uh, SMIC, built SMIC, SMIC has had churches for a decade, more than a decade. Right. Yeah, uh, I it's just built say... a little Taipei uh, in Shanghai, basically with really good beef noodles to attract uh, Taiwanese engineers. Uh, go ahead, Cleet. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I think there are some very public examples, you know, of theft, some of which, you know, I think the president even mentioned what happened with Micron um, and, you know, the, the fact that other Chinese companies have popped up with the same technology that they stole. I think if you look at USTR's 301 report, you see the, the pervasiveness of the forced technology transfer policies, you know, and then I think you look at things like, I think it's the Thousand Talents program that basically recruits you know, all of the U.S. individuals and then tries to bring them back to China. I mean, so, you know, there's, there's a combination of policies that I think manifest themselves in a lot of different ways. And it's pretty clear that that is part of China's playbook. Um, I would and that is I, I, precisely the stuff we need to be worried about. I would argue without the huge number of subsidies, none of that would be practical. Yeah, I, I agree with Willie on the on the econ side, the straight econ side, that su that subsidies are are the biggest problem, um, and they enable 
you know, if you steal the technology and you don't have the subsidies, you can't scale up, right? And the, so the subsidies give you the incentive to steal or coerce. I, I don't know, I mean, Jimmy would know more, maybe others would too about, about IP theft within chips, but someone would have to make an argument that chips are somehow really different, uh, which they might be, because we know there's, you know, reams of evidence of Chinese IP theft and coercion in, in various sectors. And we know that this is now a target sector for China. And I would again argue that the state involvement tends to blunt innovation. Uh, I don't think it's a net help. Um, so that technology coercion and theft is going to be, is likely at least, maybe it won't work, or attempts at technology coercion and theft are likely at least, um, uh, you know, in, in semiconductors as well. And since I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit putting Jimmy on the spot because he knows more about this than I do, I would add that the argument that he made at the beginning, which I accept, that US firms really need the Chinese market um, for revenue, while it does fund American innovation, it also is an obvious point of leverage for, for, for Beijing to say, look the other way when we coerce or steal your technology. Um, because otherwise, you know, we got other chip firms we can deal with. So I, I, you know, I don't have specific examples here as I do in some other sectors of the economy, but I don't see why this, if it isn't a problem now, I don't see why it's not going to become a big problem even though I agree that subsidies are on the econ side an even bigger problem. Jimmy, you're on the spot. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously intellectual property and the protection of it has been a you know fundamental issue between the US and China for a long time. It is not new. Um, China has made strides in improving things like its patent law, its, its enforcement of IP, but we all know at the end of the day, it tends to be selective and and when state-owned enterprises are involved, oftentimes the outcomes are just not that great. Um, so improvements definitely need to be made. Um, and there are, you know, unfortunate incidents. I think Cleet mentioned the Micron case and others where, you know, there has been intellectual property that's been misappropriated. Um, but, you know, I think um, one thing that's really key is this technology is more complex than others. Um, you, you know, simply cannot hire two or three engineers and say, we're gonna be able to replicate a DRAM plant. You need to hire several hundred at once. And now the thing is, China's doing that. Um, they have so much uh, government investment at hand that for example, I was visiting um, about a year ago, one chip plant in Eastern China that had 450 Taiwanese engineers who flew from Taipei to that city um, every weekend back and forth. Um, and they'd all formerly been engineers and another foreign company developing the same technology. Um, so I think, you know, it's the question of scale again and the investment uh, sometimes that enables this. And that's really, that's, you know, but the interesting thing is that this is hurting Chinese companies too. There's been a number of reports domestically where one fab popped up in one city that stole a bunch of your engineers from another domestic fab. And so you're starting to see this issue not just affect multinationals, but also domestic companies as well. Will China uh, take steps to improve it? We hope so. Um, it's super important. Uh, that was going to be one of the issues that was discussed in the 301. Um, and, but so far, while China has made some changes to the laws on the books, we need to see more progress in terms of enforcement. Okay, um, there's a number of questions here about what third countries are doing uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, semiconductors. Um, I guess a um, question, first of all, to Jimmy and Willie, do you see Japanese, um, Korean, European firms eagerly trying to take advantage of the uh, American companies and ability to sell? Then I'll ask uh, Clayton and Derek, you know, how much do you expect that uh, any uh, future administration would have success in actually getting these countries, to, uh, you know, really follow the American lead here? Well, well, I think Korea has benefited uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Korea and J Japan have benefited from uh, uh, being non-American sources. You see that in the export numbers already. I, I think okay. it's very uh, clear. I mean, if you're a if you're a Chinese chip maker, um, you know, if you're buying equipment, if you're buying software, if you're buying chips, if you're an electronics company. If you now have the choice to choose between a non-American solution and American solution, um, oftentimes Chinese companies, for example, in the past where they'd give 100 or 90% of the procurement to the leading American company because it was better, it was cheaper, it's more available, uh, the supply chain was managed better. Now they're saying you're gonna get 50% of that contract. And we're gonna give 20% to those in China, 30% to those in Asia. We're gonna diversify our supply chain. Um, 
We're seeing that, for example, you mentioned Ingri Air Conditioner, uh, BYD, a number of companies who are now making the decision that they need a second and third source that oftentimes includes a Chinese supplier where they're investing in them to help them grow their capability. That includes uh, non-US but foreign companies that can help fill the void. So clearly, you know, it's an opportunity. I think even Huawei has been toting um, very publicly its investment and component procurement in South Korea and Japan. Fleet and Derek, can Europe and uh, Japan work with the US? Uh, you know, I mentioned this before, and I mean, I, 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 I think exactly what what Jimmy and what uh, Willie are saying is is the problem here. Is they're making money in China right now, and so you know the incentives for them to stop that you know are, are pretty tough. And so I think you know we need to figure out a way that for a, from a political standpoint, it's in their interests domestically. To stop doing this business with China, um, because I think they think it's in their economic interest right now. And so, you know, we talk a lot about working with allies. I think we've had some successes. You know, at the end of the day, when they're making a lot of money in China, it's hard for them to stop um, unless we can convince them, or at least they're or they're convinced by their own people that that China is such a threat that that, that it's in their political interest to stop. And I think to do that, we just need to continue to be more and more public about what are the problems with China, what are the challenges our companies are facing, so that where we do take targeted actions, we have others with our, with our side to make it more effective. But it's tough. So, you know, please, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question on that. Okay, so let's say you're a German company, okay, and uh, you're making payroll by selling to China and you tell them to stop for political reasons. Well, you've seen that happen in the United States, right? I mean, we, our companies, and you know, I think Jimmy can attest to this, I can as well. I mean, our companies are making money in China and our government has basically told them that they need to stop, you know, that there's gonna be a cost to them um, because this is the policy that we need to do for national security. And I think there is enough political support in that for that position that the administration more or less has gotten away with it so far. Now, I think you need to sort of backfill that, as we mentioned before, with the subsidies and other things to help the industry. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, other countries haven't yet made the same calculus as we have. Uh, this yeah, is really, uh, it's easy to yeah, say uh, it's multilateral. It's really hard to do it. Well, I'm just saying when you get down to the economics, okay, and jobs and staying in business by selling to China, uh, it's, it's a very tough choice. I, that's why I think it's so hard. I mean, one thing we could do, uh, we've talked about running faster here. Um, you have to get your own house in order before you work effectively multilaterally. Um, we need to be saying, these are our regulations. Let's, let's take firma as an example. We didn't get a lot of cooperation on investment screening pre-FIRMA. The world has changed, but one of the things in the world has changed is we not only passed FIRMA, we implemented it. You can see the investment regulations. It gives somebody to cooperate, uh, a basis of cooperation, a basis of, of emulating the US model to some extent. And they know our policies are gonna be stable. And of course, FIRMA does not um, inhibit investment into the US. It might even create a little space for investment in the US by most of our friends and allies. Um, so we need to do something like that on export controls, for example, where we don't have regulations. So no one can see what we're going to do. Uh, I would argue we don't have a political commitment to regulations, but we have to take care of that first and then talk to our friends and allies. We're not gonna be able to do this as a giant coordinated effort without an, a clear and consistent American position, which we do not have. Uh, and you know, beyond that, it is still gonna be hard but with that, we have a chance to say to people, look, our, you know, we're not cutting you out of these supply chains. We're cutting unreliable or, or predatory partners out of the supply chains. You're still in it. Um, that's an opportunity to some extent. And you can rely on US policy going forward to be consistent. Um, if we can do that, we can bring some countries over. I don't think we can bring everyone over because we have a different view of the Chinese security threat uh, than perhaps some of the European countries, for example. But we're not going to convince anyone unless they're convinced that US policy is both clear and stable, which it, I think it is on firm, it's not perfect, but it's clear and stable. And we've seen some emulation and some multilateral cooperation. It is not there on technology controls. 
All right, and we think oh, we have a f about five minutes left, and I, maybe we can just do one or two more uh, questions. Um, but uh, you know, I, uh, w one interesting question here is that um, you know, it's uh, you Chinese firms are trying to now avoid a little bit more of um, U.S. technologies, and so I guess a question to um, Derek and Cleet: Is it still you know the goal of uh, U.S. government to try to really promote a lot more sales uh, of uh, American products in China, and how do you recover that trust if uh, some Chinese companies Companies are not so eager to buy American again. So I, I think the answer is yes and no. And I, I mentioned this before. You know the the um, you know the Phase One deal is on its face, you know, an anti-decoupling measure intended to increase sales. However, um, you know, one of the things that China wanted to secure in the Phase One deal uh, was a supply of very sensitive technologies and 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 different products from the United States and the administration rejected that. So I think you have this situation where I was talking about before, where I don't think you can look at it and make generalizations. I think the generally speaking US policy is still for agriculture and things like that to increase sales. But in some of these other areas, you know, maybe we can increase sales in the non-sensitive stuff, but on the most sensitive semiconductor type technology, I think right now that is not the position of the administration that we should increase those sales. And so again, it's a nuanced type answer. Uh, before COVID took over everything and made you know, most of our lives work uh, irrelevant for an extended period of time, uh, President Trump infuriated me in January. And I'm, I'm sure you guys remember the statement because we're following this where he said, I, you know, the US is open for business and I'm not gonna let this so-called national security excuse interfere with selling, I believe it was uh, GE engines to China. I don't think this administration, as we see in the phase one deal, wants to inhibit exports at all. It pretends it, it does, and I'm sure people within the administration do, but the administration as a whole, led by the president, they wanna cut the trade deficit primarily, increase exports, create jobs in the United States. Um, so I, I think to now, we haven't been trying to, to it, really trying to, to limit our exports. I think it's possible in the Biden administration that we would. I'm not sure. I don't know who the Secretary of Commerce is going to be, the White House Chief of Staff, all of those fun things. Um, but I don't know that we will get a, a second a, a Biden presidency that is as focused on cutting bilateral trade deficit with China and therefore on exports and therefore on sales, even of sensitive items, as the Trump administration has been. So I think in, you know there's an example of a split between the two. I think if the president wins re-election, we're still going to get the trade deficit as being the worst thing in the relationship. And you know it'll be solved by more exports or fewer imports. Uh, if, if Vice President Biden wins election, I think we're gonna get a more diverse view of the relationship and it could involve sharper restrictions on the nature of US exports, even though that will cost the United States something economically. So let me ask a follow-up on that. Could I ask a quick follow-up on that? Okay, okay so the, the, the last January, question, and then we'll have the, to turn it the over. The January issue was uh, with regard to leap engines from CFM, right, going to COMAC and other, other players, okay? And so would you rather have uh, the Western supplier, the US supplier, GE Aviation, lose the scale? And now, especially in this COVID era, where that is uh, looking to be the only market that's gonna recover in the near term? So, you know, my answer is I, you know, I trust on the national security side, if someone tells me that we're selling equipment to China that could upgrade their military capabilities, the answer is yes, then you restrict the deal. Uh, I don't have an independent judgment of whether that's true or not. Um, if it just says an aircraft engine and, and, and you know we don't like selling aircraft engines, I think the argument is much weaker, although then you would have to look at domestic competition. But you know, it's the, the point is the president, my attack on the president was not um, that he made a reasoned judgment. He referred to national security as an excuse to block sales. It's not an excuse. If there's a good national security justification, you block the sale. And in fact, you go to possible foreign competitors of the United States who might make the sale and say, you can't do this. This could put American servicemen and women in danger. If there isn't a national security reason, different story. Then it's a straight economic calculation about whether the China, this will enable a Chinese competitor or not. Okay, so your answer is really uh, strategic rationale rather than transactional, which is what you were being critical of. Okay, yes. fair enough. And I would jump in with here. That, uh, all I'm right, with that, uh, all right, um, Cleet, Cleet, uh, uh, 10 seconds. <laughs> I'm not sure I can do it in 10. My point, this is just the point I've been making before. Not every single sale to a Chinese company is a national security threat. 
And I think that's what the president was getting at is that he gets that justification from some of his hawks quite a bit. And I do think you need to make a sophisticated nuanced decision on the basis of the facts before you. And I think, you know, just blocking every sale is not to me the right answer for US national security. Okay, with that, I have to uh, hand it over uh, back to Marva Conley, our host. You all delivered and then some. Thank you so much. Thank you to Dan Wong for pulling this group together and all of your work with your keynote presentation. Thank you to Jimmy Goodrich, Willie Shi, Cleet Willems, and Derek Scissors. This was the best program we've had on semiconductors and we hope to have you back. This was the fourth of our Seeking Truth Through Facts US-China program series. Our final program is on January 14th. It's a virtual conference on the future of US and China. We are gonna be honoring George Schultz, our honorary chair who turns 100 next month. If you haven't registered, please do join us. And if you're interested in sponsoring us or developing one of the panels, uh, reach out to us too. Asia Society is ho hosting virtual programs around the world. You can find all, all of our programs at asiasociety.org forward slash online. We're a nonprofit with a mission of building bridges. And if you aren't a member, please consider joining us. For those of us joining the VIP reception, please click over to the second link that was emailed to you right before this program. And thank you very much to our team, Pilar, Rexel, Jamie, and Michael, and uh, again, to all of our speakers and to Dan Wong, and from all of us at the Northern California Center, stay safe.